came straight away with kind of problem. Certainly since the 1920s, the countryside has been a special place in the histories of the war. It was, in many accounts, in the villages of rural England, and here I mean England, for the experience elsewhere, especially Ireland and Scotland, was very different. It was in the villages of England that the loss of innocence, so often remarked upon as a legacy of 1914, was seen at its most profound. This is seen most clearly in memoirs written after the war. Um, a whole of uh, Siegfried Sassoon's wonderful trilogy, The Complete Memoirs of George Sherston, is an elegy to a lost and more innocent way of rural life. In books as diverse as Mabel K. Ashby's Joseph Ashby of Paizo, Flora Thompson's Lark Rise, and John Moore's autobiographical novels of Tewkesbury. For Mabel Ashley, looking back from the 1950s, the, the weeks, the events of August 1914 took on a tragic importance and even a kind of finality. She writes, the last days of July and the 1st of August, my mother and I harnessed a pony every evening and drove five miles from Lower Town to Kyneton Post Office to read in the windows the latest telegrams. Each evening the whole valley was bathed in golden, serene summer light but on the 3rd of August, the weather changed. The sunset was more gorgeous than ever, but the valley was filled with a mist of raucous purple. When my mother recited the messages we had brought home, there was a long silence, and my father, the Joseph Ashby of the book's title, broke with the only possible words, few things will ever be the same again. It has to be admitted straight away that there is some truth in this view. Nobody can doubt, looking at the war memorials in every English village, that the countryside suffered desperately, and probably in terms of percentage population, worse than many urban areas. Yet there was also a dimension created by pre-war beliefs in the centrality of the rural to the meaning of Englishness. From at least the 1880s, a strand of thought developed, initially among the elite, the elite that the core of Englishness lay in the rural areas. Here, the race and its culture continued unsolid by the urban and, more importantly, metropolitan influences of the cities, and especially of London. Left-wing writers like William Morris shared with right-wing ones like Henry Ryder Haggard or Rudyard Kipling these ideas. At the right wing, and probably the most extreme end, the core of them was summed up by Lord Walsingham, a Norfolk landowner who wrote in 1902 to Sir Henry Ryder Haggard, I think you'll admit the city breeds one stamp of human being and the country breeds another. I so I was born in the country. <laughs> they may be a little sharper in town, but after all, it is not mere sharpness that has made Great Britain what she is. It is the thews and sinews of her sons which are the foundation of everything. Take the people away from their natural breeding grounds, thereby sapping their health and strength in <coughs> cities such as nature never intended to be the permanent home of men, and the decay of the country is only a matter of time. Walsingham is perhaps an extreme example, but his general sense was shared by many in the years before the war. To them, rural life and culture was the essence of Englishness. They lived in the country, they collected and sang folk songs and dances. They sought to protect rural crafts. And above all, to make these things central to revival of England and Englishness. For that reason, the rural areas, right at the beginning of the war, became central to the war's long-term interpretation and what it meant in 1914 in all sorts of ways. However, in 1914, Rural England Wales confronted two very practical problems. The first was common to the whole nation, the raising of a volunteer <coughs> army. The second was peculiar to agriculture, the need to feed a country at war. And the relationship between these two things was to dominate the war in the countryside. And it was especially difficult, since if you remember, agriculture is still largely unmechanized and relied very heavily on hand labour. Interestingly, initially the idea that agricultural input might have to be increased because of war 
was not universally recognised. Although Britain in 1914 relied for about 80% of its wheat and 40% of its meat on imports, it was widely assumed by the government and industry that war would not disrupt these supplies to any extent. In the immediate pre-war years, the possibility of blockade had been discussed, but the belief on the invincibility of the Royal Navy led the committees on imperial defence to conclude in February 1914 that by maintaining a general control of sea communications, this country should, in future as in the past, be able to beat any exhausting consequences of war. The President of the Board of Agriculture, Lord Lucas, repeated his view on the 4th of August at the outbreak of war when he told the House of Lords, quote, there was no occasion whatever for public alarm over food supplies. To begin with, at least, these optimistic forecasts were right. The pre-war switch back to cereal production, particularly on good lands after the early 1900s, continued. <coughs> the yield of the harvest of 1914 was up. In 1915, the situation was better still. Increased prices, especially for wheat, meant the farmers planned more and harvest showed an increase of over 20% in wheat and 8% in oats. However, there were beginning to be problems. Little of the land that was producing this was new land, and the increases had been made from switching from barley and by leaving out rotation courses. Worse still, it became clear that by 1916, many farmers had further reduced the root break in traditional rotation, causing long-term decrease in productivity. Also, for the first time in 1916, overseas supplies began to fall. The harvest of that year was bad all over North America, while the loss of grain imports from the Black Sea areas of Russia, Turkey and Romania caused by Turkey's alliance with the Central Powers and the closure of the Dardanelles to Allied shipping made the situation worse. Finally, in the winter of 1916-17, to 17, the German U-boat campaign in the North Atlantic began to take a serious toll of shipping. In the autumn and winter of 1916, for the first time, the food serious situation looked serious. Business as usual may have been, as many historians have argued, quote, the experience of farming industry in the first half of the war, and, many and in many ways that was the case throughout the rural community. There certainly was a rush to join the colours in the rural areas, as there was in the towns, Yet many farm workers found a clash of interest between the needs of harvest and the care of animals. As Billa Dixon from Trunch in Norfolk, a man I interviewed in the early 1970s, said, We were always two or three days nearly longer than anywhere else on a big farm. We were always three or four days or a month. When the war came, we just started harvest on the 4th of August, and so I joined up as soon as we finished harvest. They were calling for volunteers. Several of us in the village, I should think about ten of us, went that morning down to Munsley and joined up and took the shilling. Recruitment in rural areas relied heavily, at least in the first months of the war, on appeals to the traditional values of country life and social structure. What Keith Greaves writes of Sussex could be uh, true of many counties. In August 1914, he writes, the landowning social economic elite of Sussex envisaged a central role in the county's, in the county's preparation, preparations for war, predicted on the belief that paternalistic model of social relations had a relevance beyond the bonding of rural society, involving notions of privilege, duty and responsibility. In the process of transport, to the process of transforming Sussex into a county um, of arms. The rural elite used their control, particularly of the pre-war territorial forces, like the yeomanry in these pictures, um, through their roles of officers and honorary patrons and their position of landowners and parsons and even farmers to urge men into the ranks. Landowners these rights frequently selected likely men from among their servants and farm labourers and transported them to the nearest recruiting office. Lieutenant Colonel A.C. Borton, who owned an estate in Chaveney in Kent, was a local justice of the peace, drove his butler, foreman and cowman to Maidstone Barracks to enlist. 
the Royal Berkshire Regiment included one platoon of butlers and footmen, and another composed almost exclusively of gardeners and workers for a peer's estate. This paternalism, at least at the beginning of the war, worked both ways. In September 1914, the Norfolk Chamber of Agriculture agreed, quote, to keep open the places of all those, all those employees who have joined the forces of the King. In Sussex, the Marquis of Abergavenny guaranteed housing, quote, for the duration for all those who fought, while Lady Margaret Duckworth opened a post office savings account for every man who enlisted. <coughs> However, such schemes were unusual. As Greaves writes of Sussex, few landowners public committed themselves to compensating estate workers whose army pay was insufficient to provide an adequate income for their family. <coughs> As the war dragged on, this paternalist pressure to enlist became a source of real grievance. In Siegfried Sassone's bitter lines, Squire nagged and bullied till I went to fight under Lord Derby's scheme. I died in hell, they called it Passchendaele found real echo time and time again in the lives of countrymen and women. Some, in 1914, went to war for economic reasons. In the rural areas, the approach of winter threatened many casual and even full-time workers with the prospects of unemployment, while in the towns, the new labour exchanges encouraged the unemployed to enlist. A private's pay of six shillings, eight and a half pence a week was less than a farm worker, even in the poorest district. But it was regular, and the separation allowances paid to wives and mothers, even if they were slow in coming. However, for most countrymen who joined the new armies, it's clear that a vague patriotism... Uh, sorry. Uh, a vague patriotism, personal or collective, was the main motive for enlisting. Their feelings were often inarticulate and low-key once the shouting had died down. <coughs> As Peter Simpkins points out, um, they, their actions were often more considered than the myth of 1914 suggests. Less than one-third of all volunteers uh, were involved in the first rush to the colours in August and September 1914, which suggests, quote, a sense of duty and obligation rather than missionary zeal. George Hewins whose remarkable life, um, I'm sure you, many of you know, as an irregular and casual employer in and around Stratford and Avon, put it neatly and clearly. If you'd asked me why I was going to fight, I'd have said to save the country. If the Germans won, we'd have been slaves. More striking was the fact that the services were now recruiting from all over the working class. Before the 1914, the army was all too seen as the last refuge of those of social and moral disgrace. In contrast, the new armies were composed, at least according to contemporaries like V.W. Germains, of decent, self-respecting, industrious working men. While Kipling thought the new armies so, were, were superior because the corrupting influence of old soldiers was absent in the new battalions. No such problem encountered the rural elite, for whom the army had always been a respectable career. Officers' training schools of public schools and universities provided a military background for most of the rural elite, <coughs> and even those who missed that found at home in the territorial forces. To these young men, rural life provided the model for an officer's behaviour. Pre-war officers were, according to Keith Simpson, encouraged to follow the pursuits and lifestyles of a country gentleman, and much of that ideal was carried over to the war. To the young officers of the new armies, especially for those from the rural areas, it was my men, my platoon, who took on the residence of my village and my workers. In turn, the men responded within the same frame framework of deference and paternalism. It can be no coincidence that two of the most powerful pre-war accounts, post-war accounts of the war, Sassoon's complete memoirs of George Surston and Edward Blunden's undertones of war, both function within a rhetoric of the rural. As the men who marched away left, so the England, rural England slowly adjusted to the business of war. Here, business as usual concealed many changes which were at first unclear or even trivial, uh, but which were beginning by 1916 to have real effects on rural society. 
Although very many historians have argued there was no real change, at least in the first years of the war, this was by no means obvious to contemporaries. As a result, employment channels began to change, among women in particular. Before the war, the only real employment available to young women in the countryside was on the land or in domestic service. The former was becoming much less respectable and had been decreasing for decades before, the 19, before 1914, while the latter domestic service was expanding. As men joined up, both rural and urban areas saw opportunities open for a country girl, especially in urban areas and country towns where work had not been considered unsuitable for the work had been not only considered unsuitable before the war, um, but where most trades had been closed to women. In these new areas of employment, wages were very good, especially to a countryman woman whose father probably earned about 14 shillings a week in 1914. In Leicester in 1916, a young woman could earn 52 shillings a week plus uniform and a week's paid holiday as a tram conductress, while unskilled work in factories in the same town paid 40 shillings a week. Many of the new jobs were in the great conurbations of the north, but many were not. Ransoms of Ipswich, for instance, was only one of many regional agricultural engineering firms which switched to wartime production. In Warwickshire, where there were so many munitions factories that, quote, there was great difficulty in persuading females to take any kind of land work. There were also changes to the women who stayed behind in the villages. Two sources of women's workers were available. The most obvious were what contemporaries called village women. However, there are a number of factors working against the recruitment of these women. For married women, at least until 1917, allowances to soldiers, wives and families kept up with flat inflation, and many families were better off than before the war. <coughs> Additionally, the billeting of soldiers provided valuable income in many areas. To single women, as we've already suggested, the urban areas provided much higher wages than agriculture. Perhaps most importantly, for 50 years, country women had been told their their betters that field work was unwomenly and demeaning, and could not simply and that could simply not be reversed overnight. Further, in the areas where trade unions had been organised, there was widespread opposition to women's work, since it was argued it lowers men's wages. Even where union spokesmen appealed for women workers in agriculture, they often got short shift. When George Edwards, the president of the National Agricultural Laborers Union, spoke at a series of meetings in April 1916, urging women back to the land, a working woman replied in a letter to the press, quote, he had better direct his advice to the middle class and rich men's daughters, as some of them had never done a day useful day's work in their lives. <laughs> However, the government was beginning to act. In 1916, the County War Agricultural Committees were ordered to set up Women's War Agricultural Committees to register countrymen, women, who were willing to work on the land and put them into contact with farmers uh, who needed labour. By the end of 1916, it was claimed that about 140,000 women were registered nationally. However, the reality was somewhat different. Although in theory, about 72,000 women received a certificate saying they were, quote, True, as truly serving their country as the man who is fighting in the trenches or on the sea. Of that, 62,000 had received, and about almost 62,000 had received a bottle green amulet marked with a scarlet crown to show the wearer had done 30 days approved service. Only 29,000 women were at work under this scheme by the end of 1916. There was a second area of potential recruits. Since at least the 1890s, it had been respectable, um, as good work has shown, for women to work in what was called the lighter branches of agriculture, particularly horticulture, and Studley College and others have been set up to train women to work in horticulture and poultry and so on. And at the beginning of the war, the these kind of organisations, which really represented by the Women's Farm and, Farm and Garden Union, began to organise volunteers and urge on government the necessity of creating an organisation for channelling urban and middle class women into the war effort on the land, using these women trained before the war to train others. This came into being in 1916 as the Women's National Land Service Corps. 
By early 1917, they had trained about 2,000 women on farms owned or run by sympathisers at the pre-war women's colleges or at many of the county agricultural colleges set up from the 1900s onwards. These volunteers, most of whom were middle class and urban, were seen by the women WNLSC as having a leadership role. They were trained and skilled and were to train other women to act and act as for women or recruiters. But in March 1917, a quite different group emerged, the Women's Land Army. The first appeal for recruits was designed to raise 10,000 volunteers. In fact, it raised over 30,000. And by June 1917, 2,000 Women's Land Army members had been placed on farms. The WLA was, it was argued, aimed at educated, urban, thus presumably bourgeois women, who were then supposed to serve as examples for rural women in local villages. Nevertheless, the WLA was not simply a showpiece. Its volunteers were well trained, had proper uniforms, and were paid on a national rate of wages, 18 to 20 shillings a week, not far off the national wage for male farm workers. They were also given extra payments for skills such as tractor driving and ploughing. Additionally, additionally, there can be little doubt that they were capable of doing the same work as the increasingly elderly workforce left on many farms. <coughs> Initially, at least, the WLA met with hostility from farmers, farm workers and many village women. Their dress, which included breeches, was a source of horror and much discussion. However, as Susan Grayzell writes, the threatening appearance of these new women on the land in breeches and putties was carefully and deliberately feminised. More than that, the land girl was appropriated by the ongoing debate on rural decline. Here were real examples of what going back to the land could do. Urban women saved from the corruption of urban life, who in return saved the land and preserved the old English countryside, to quote, while the soil of Britain redeemed these women, creating a new, robust, yet gentle femininity. By the end of the war, nearly 12,000 women worked in a variety of farm jobs. And the importance of this was clear to both urban and rural areas. However, more important, I think, for rural women was another product of the last years of the Great War, the Women's Institute movement. Women's Institutes appeared in 1915 under the aegis of the Agricultural Organisation Society. And in September 1917, they were given government support by the, women, by the uh, Board of Agriculture. And by 1919, when the Board handed power to the WI National Federation, there were upwards of 1,200 institutes. Recent scholarship, particularly work by Maggie Andrew, has stressed just how essential the WI was to women's experience of the interwar period by creating a women's support network within every rural village, which, quote, was significant for confidence raising and helped challenge dominant perceptions of femininity. This was clearly recognised by Mont Abbott, a Cotswold shepherd, who later was interviewed and produced a book, but who I knew well in, in the late 60s and early 70s. He's a great man, a great singer. Um, uh, who, looking at the WI, called it the biggest revolution of all, most institutes in the village before the war, he wrote, had, had been clubs for working men. Women went, weren't supposed to club together on purpose. They'd congregate occasionally in the bode of love, the little kitchen at the back of the pub. But coming together on purpose as a body and calling themselves W.I., well, well, they were only doing what men had been doing in the pub for years. <laughs> Women uh, of the rural aristocracy and gentry were perhaps less affected by the war directly, although casualties among the men of the aristocracy were high. Lady Curson wrote of the period 1914-15, there was scarcely one of our friends who did not lose a son, a husband or a brother. Many great families, partly in response to these losses, as well as to deeply held patriotism of their class, gave up country and town houses as hospitals or commonly convalescent rooms, uh, homes for the wounded, uh, often like the Duchess of Rutland, taking on the role of matron for themselves. Elsewhere, uh, wives and daughters of those who enlisted ran estates and farms. The Countess of Airlie wrote in memoirs, my entire Heisen, I a horizon was bounded by potatoes. Every vine house was stuffed full of them, 
Even the little hut at the back of the gardens was stacked with potato boxes from the floor to the roof. Elsewhere, within the elite, concerns were more prosaic and perhaps more selfish. Aristocratic and gentry encouragement of servants to enlist and conscription after 1916 led to a servant shortage. In March 1916, May, poor Carcourt's chauffeur was called up and her butler became ill. I have a load of domestic worries, she wrote, but no doubt we'll weather the storm somehow. It is a great bore losing one's butler, as somehow it was the last male servant one expected to be bereft of. At Goodwood in Sussex, the door staff dropped from over 20 in the pre war years to 12 by 1917, although all only three were male. As with the middle and the working class, it was the young women of the elite who probably saw most change in the war. Joan Poinder, an aristocrat from aristocratic family, told Thea Thompson in the 1970s that she, quote, had a passion for independence and I knew that I wasn't to get, going to get much in pre-war days except through marriage, but luckily I got it immediately by pretending I was much older and going in for nursing. Nevertheless, some London social life, I'm sure you'll be not surprised to hear, continued, indeed took on in many ways a more frenetic tone in some bizarre reworking of an anthem for doomed youth. Both Venetia Stanley, youngest child of Lord Sheffield and Lady Diana Manners, managed to, quote, come out in full debutant style in 1917 and lead full social libraries, lives. The background against which these changes in women's position was taking place was also undergoing transition. Alongside the bad harvest in British Isles and North America in 1916, a series of crises had led first to a coalition government and then to Lloyd George becoming Premier. Business as usual in agriculture and elsewhere came to an end. In agriculture, this was signalled by the arrival of Roman Prothero, Lord Ernley, as President of the Board of Agriculture. Prothero was a historian as well as an agriculturalist who believed that Britain's agriculture needed state support to return it to the position it had held in the 1870s. His arrival marked the beginning of an organised food policy, the first in British history, and probably, you could argue, marks the beginning of modern British farming. <clears throat> the first phase of this policy, which ran from January to August 1917, was designed to encourage farmers to plough up grassland. This was done through increasing the power of the war agricultural committees, giving them power to compel uh, cultivation. And it was done initially by consultation, but they did actually have power to compel people to plow up. Um, and they actually, in the end, could uh, cause the eviction of a tenant, although only 317 had been evicted by the end of the war. If you read some accounts of the war, you'd think they evicted 25,000. Um, much more significant. Uh, was the second phase, the so-called um, Corn Production Act of 1917. Quote, farmers were given guaranteed minimum prices for wheat and oats up to 1922. Barley was admitted. Why was barley admitted? Yeah. What do you use barley for? Beer. 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 That's right. <laughs> They admitted barley because it was used for, for beer and um, whiskey. Uh, during the existence, in its existence of guaranteed prices, there was to be a minimum wage for agricultural workers enforced by wages boards. Owners and tenants of agricultural land would be to require cropping, to follow cropping directions issued by the agricultural departments uh, to ensure the use of land in the national interest. There should be no increase in rents and the result of the maintenance of minimum. So minimum prices, a wages board, no increase in rents. Now, the success of this policy is a matter uh, of debate. After the war, it was argued that the farmers had saved Britain and that it had been done through the wages board. That's partly true, but it's also um, one thing which people don't... They, they changed the milling quota, for instance by increasing 20%. So you've got flour, which looks more like the stuff you pay £5.50 a bag for now, uh, rather than the stuff you pay £1 a bag for in the supermarket to make the bread. Um, and they didn't, nobody really noticed. Um, 
But the short term, the most dramatic effect, I think, was on the farm worker. <coughs> Since 1912, the farm workers' unions had argued um, for a national minimum wage in agriculture. And this is what they got. They got it negotiated at county level by county wages committees. Um, and those counties set wages, which were then agreed by the national board. Wages boards consisted of representatives of the union, normally the National Agricultural Labourers Union, or sometimes the Workers' Union, of the organised farmer, which usually meant by this stage members of the NFU, and by what were called independent members, who were in theory agriculturalists with some knowledge of the area. In fact, they were often very fine, very good people. Either. Um, I think the most important thing about the Wages Board was it took wage bargaining out of the individual labourers and farmers' hands and put them into those of the union. As Jack Leader and Norfolk Teeman, that's for you as a horseman, who remembered the board's coming, said, men were afraid, you see, that's understandable. But the union did away with all that sort of thing, and that was a good job when they negotiated the harvest wage and your weekly wage. The Wages Board also marked a transition uh, in relationship between master and man, even if it was to be temporary. The farm worker of the first year's defense, the years this century developed a complete increasing sense of his worth and even his power. In many areas, this found um, expression in <coughs> union membership. Between 1917 and 1921, membership soared. Not since the heady days of Joseph Archer's union in the 1870s had the farmer had such organised power. In 1914, the National Agricultural Labourers Union had 2,000, uh, sorry, had um, 350 branches and about 9,000 members. By 1919, it had 2,300 branches and 170,000 members. While the agricultural section of the workers' union had over 100,000 members. Put simply, nearly 50% of farm labourers were, were union members by the end of the war. But in some areas, it was not simply union membership. There have been strikes throughout the war which showed the power the union now held on the men in some areas at least. In 1917, Robert Walker, the secretary of the National Agricultural Labourers' Union, welcomed the Russian Revolution in a series of public meetings throughout the rural areas. I, find, I don't think this is one such meeting. It would be nice to think it was. It's, it's just a lot of union meeting in Mopar. Um, uh, finally, in 1918, the election for the first time, Socialist and Labour Party candidates backed by the union appeared in rural areas. Um, uh, both liberal and, con and uh, in opposing both liberals and conservatives. But their success was limited, but in many areas the mould was broken. What's interesting is that the first truly Labour, rural Labour member of Parliament was elected in by election in 1921 in the constituency where I now live, uh, South Norfolk. And that was old George Edwards, uh, later Sir George Edwards of the Independent Union. By then, although, but by then, although the war was moving to its inclusion, a near successful German spring offensive of 1918 stretched the resources of the country and countryside to the limit. The upper age for conscription was raised to 51, and moves were made to reduce the numbers exempt from conscription. In the rural areas, the war agricultural committees fought back, arguing harvest was coming and there was already a labour shortage. As a result, as a result, only about half the men demanded from agriculture had been found when the government dropped its demands in June 1918. When the lights came on again in 1918, after four years of bitter warfare, their glow revealed a rural England that was in many ways prosperous. All who had not fought seemed to have done well from the war. This sense of economic success and stability was to last for barely three years, but it was to create for itself almost the character of a lost golden age in the bitter decades that followed. However, not all sections of rural society fared equally well. On the surface, at least, the landlords had probably done least well. 
Rents had, by and large, stayed at pre-war levels and then not risen since 1917. But neither had they been reduced as they had been in the pre-war period. Further, wartime demand meant that no, no land needed to be unlet. The end of the war saw this rapidly change. Apparently stable or rising prices, guaranteed of course by Government Act, made agricultural land a desirable commodity. However, since suddenly increasing rents might have rendered landlords liable for any income tax, the sale of land suddenly seemed an attractive proposition. As a result, sales increased very rapidly. The avalanche came with the spring of 1919, wrote the great historian Michael Thompson, and quote, by the end of March, a thousand square miles, or well over a half a million acres, was on the market. By December 1922, something like a quarter of the agricultural land of England had changed hands. That sounds quite startling, but remember it means three quarters remained in the same hands. <laughs> despite these changes, the immediate post-war years did not mark, despite contemporary fears, the end of an old social order. Rather, it marked initially a further modification in the spread of landlord capital. While some estates, especially small ones, were sold entirely, most landlords simply took advantage of the favourable market to transfer part of their capital into the more lucrative stocks and bonds, as their families had often done in the past. For example, in 1919, Lord Aylesford um, sold 2,000 acres of his 17,000 acre estate in Warwickshire. The Earl of Yarborough sold 2,000 acres in Lincolnshire of his 50,000 acres in eastern England. The Marquis of Chumley sold 2,000 acres in Cheshire, about an eighth of his estate. While well, the 15th Earl of Pembroke sold seven acres of his 40,000 acres in Wilton. What's happening here is what we see actually interesting happening about 100 years earlier. What you've got is big estates selling off outlying portions. Uh, many estates were scattered all over the countryside, all over Britain, because you know, they got bits through marriage, usually through marriage settlements, they'd acquire random stuff everywhere. For, I mean, the Cooks of Norfolk, for instance, the great um, agricultural revolution family, had land in Egremont, in Northampton. Um, you know, it was, and they had, they had sufficient land in Lancashire in 1880 to be le Lord Lieutenants of Lancashire, and while the, most of their land was in fact in Norfolk. Some small estates did go up and more to follow into the war period. As in the 1880s and 1890s, it was the gentry with no capital but land and relatively small quantities of that who suffered most. These, like the great Arist those like the great aristocrats, aristocrats who held valuable urban property and a large portfolio of stocks and bonds survived even the worst term. Small was also a relative definition. Sir Oswald Mosley's family sold most of the 3,000 acres of their Rolleston estate in Staffordshire in 1919, and the rest followed, breaking up a 300-year relationship with the land and the, uh, the area and certainly contributing to uh, Mosley's later vision of a fascist Britain. Moving down the scale, those who had done best were probably the farmers. The Great War saw agriculture in a state of prosperity unparalleled since the 1870s. The reduction of imports in wheat coupled with government guaranteed prices from, 1920, from 1917 had produced a serious period of stable and high prices for those producing cereals. <clears throat> in other areas, sectors, this story was different. Dairy production, probably the most successful area of farming in the years 1880 to 1914, suffered badly in wartime, through the size, though the size of the national herd remained stable. The central problem here was a declining output per cow, a direct result of the shortage of imported feedstock. A similar problem lay behind the declining livestock output. Again, although the number of animals in the national herd remained stable, their sale weight fell and farmers sold younger beasts because of the shortage of feeds for overwintering, a practice covered by government, um, uh, a practice encouraged, encouraged by government errors in misunderstanding how farming worked. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this is that the Ministry of Agriculture is a creation of the war. 
Before the war, there was something called the Board of Agriculture, which was a government department that it was almost amateur uh, in, in, in who ran it, and it was seen it didn't really have a very central role. One of the things that changed massively in the 20s and 30s is the growing power of the Ministry of Agriculture and the growing power of agricultural science. Um, even if it takes time to get through to the working farmer, it begins to be a serious matter. This agricultural prosperity, though, general, benefited some areas more than others. Most obviously, those parts of England where cereal production was dominant, notably God's heartland, East Anglia, made most, but this concealed the fact that it was often difficult to find extra land to bring into cultivation, and so savings and gains were made in other ways particularly by what they used to call farming dirty. Um, not, not weeding, not picking up stones, not going right to the edge of fields, things like that. Um, in contrast, other areas, some southern counties, Lancashire and the east and west ridings, for example, found extra land to bring under plough. Here, both permanent and temporary grass had been ploughed and sown with oats and potatoes and more wheat planted on the existing arable. In other areas, long-established lays were ploughed up, uh, although here, for instance, in the north and the southwest, the lack of arable tradition caused problems because of a lack of plough teams and men and women skilled at handling them, a problem that was to reoccur in 1940. Also, in Wales, land which had gone out of arable production in the 1880s was brought back into production, especially with oats and potatoes. Given all this, few farmers were doing badly at the end of the war, except perhaps inevitably the smallest and the most marginal, especially in the upland areas. Looking back at the war period as a whole, Peter Dewey, the historian, wrote, farmers were able to raise their share of the income of industry from about two-fifths before the war to almost two-thirds by 1917. These gains were often reflected in changes of lifestyle. A.G. Street, a farmer writer from the 1930s to the 19, early 1960s, Looking back from the grimmer days of the 1930s, wrote of the years 1918 to 21, I was bad or daft or possibly more truthfully as criminally extravagant as anyone. I kept two hunters, one for myself and one for my wife, and glorious days we had together with a local pack. We went to tennis parties nearly every fine afternoon in the summer and in our turn entertained up to as many 20 guests on our tennis court and usually suppers after. In short, farmers swanked. <laughs> Perhaps the most obvious sign of the new wealth, though, was the rush by tenants to purchase their own farms. In 1919, 30%, 13% of holdings were owner-occupied. By 1927, the figure was 37%. Although as early as 1917, there is a, a dis a evidence of an increasing desire um, to buy land. Um, it was to be some years, sorry, I've, I've, I've got a page out of place here. <laughs> That's jolly good, I thought, good <laughs> Lord, I just jumped <laughs> a little bit there. Um, <clears throat> an increasing desire to purchase holdings, the main part of the increase came in the years after the war. The reason people bought land in the years after the war are many, but the most important thing was the belief that guaranteed prices for cereal crops would continue indefinitely. Um, certainly, the, in 1918, the Corn Production Act was reworked um, and became the Agriculture Act, which guaranteed seven years warning before the guaranteed price on any wheats should be removed. So it looked pretty much as though um, it was good and set. Um, it's summed up by Henry Overman, who was a great Norfolk farmer, um, who said, if it is desired to produce more food in this country after the war, it was essential that agriculture should be protected from the criminal neglect of past years. Either a minimum price must be fixed for wheat or a protective duty imposed on all foreign grain. 
he favoured the former proposal. And indeed, of course, uh, the attacks on foreign grain was unthinkable in the liberal economics of, of that period. Even if, and what went alongside this was the continuation, of course, of the wages war, of the minimum wage for farm workers and um, the, the, the benefits that went with it, which really were uh, guaranteed working hours, <coughs> guaranteed wages, uh, first time really proper links to skill. So you've got more money if you were a cowman or if you were a teaman, those sort of things. All that comes in as a result of the wages board. As a result, a lot of people buy land. Adrian Bell, who some of you may have read, a fine country writer of the 1940s and 50s, father of Martin Bell of the white suit, um, <laughs> bought his Suffolk farm um, in, in 1918. Others, like Mr. Hicks of Trunch, a man I interviewed, moved up from a 50-acre unit to one of just over 100 acres, his father did. Many, though, moved less from choice uh, than from necessity. Landlords tended to sell the land and then to go to the tenant and say, I'm going to put your farm on the market, do you want to buy it? And this forced men to buy land who might otherwise not have done. It's difficult to know. It's good times. Everybody believed the future was rosy and perfect. <coughs> and the problem is, of course, the vast majority of this land was bought on loans and on mortgages at highly inflated prices. In Norfolk, decent land, which was fetching £17 an acre in 1914, was sold for £28 an acre in 1920, a 60% increase. Uh, in Wales, where farms were sold, normally went for 20 years purchase, as they called it, they were selling at 40 years. In A.G. Street's novel, The Gentleman of the Party, the hero Bob Marsh is forced to buy his land, buy his farm in 1919 at £25 an acre, with an army camp um, uh, still on the land. And it was not so much the price as the need to borrow. To, to borrow. Um, Alec Dewey, a fine historian and ex-corn merchant uh, of Norfolk Agriculture, who interviewed a lot of men about the interwar period in the 80s and 90s, sort of points out how most normal um, channels were simply not available. So farmers borrowed money from solicitors, from auctioneers, and even from corn merchants. Um, and Lord Addison wrote very perceptively in 1938, all over the country, farmers bought their farms because they wanted to retain their home and occupation. But they bought it at a high price. They usually had to borrow two-thirds of the purchase on a mortgage, and for the rest, they put all the money they had. Not infrequently, some of the balance came from bank overdrafts on the security of their stock and general credit. The rate of interest payable to these mortgages was normally 5 or 5.5%. The power mortgage on the house market at that time is around about 1 to 2%. However, in 1919 and 1921, that didn't seem much of a problem. Farming was doing well. Um, the, even the farm worker, who for many years um, had been denied, or he thought he felt he'd been denied his part of the cake, was doing okay. However, things were obviously not entirely well. When the people whose family had fought and died in war, things clearly looked very different. And I think the final stage that I want to talk about in the way the wars hasten change was in the area that we can call ideology, or what people think about the world they live in. I argued, I spoke right at the beginning about the idea of Englishness and how this was enshrined in the countryside. Um, and after the war, this seemed to become much, much more important. If we look at the elite writings of Rupert Brooks, C.V. Sassoon, Edmund Blunden, 
the waste and the horror of founders is constantly contrasted with the soothing and restorative land uh, of England and the simple life of the East Anglian family of London's first wife. Sassoon pictured the ultimate escape for his men as a pastoral or perhaps picture postcard reworking of his Kent childhood. I wish, he wrote in his diary in 1917, I could write a book of consolation for homesick soldiers in the field. Not surprisingly, his landscape, a stereotype of the South Country, with grey church, village green, and ultimately rose-grown porch of some discreet little house with a girl in a print dress waiting, waiting for the returning footsteps along the twilight lane while the last blackbird walls in the main tree. There's no reason, I think, to believe that these feelings were restricted to the artistic relief, the artistic elite. Uh, the antithesis of the bottle field are clear in many of the postcards sent from France by ordinary soldiers. And I think, as the elite saw this rural as an escape, then many working class men felt the same. As Hardy, Dennis Hardy and Colin Ward wrote in their remarkable book, Plotlands, after the First World War, many a survivor suffering for the effects of gas was urged to get out of London, while there were others terribly disfigured who wanted to avoid the daily encounters um, of city living. And there were more who, counting themselves fortunate to have survived, resolved not to go back to the life of the urban toilet, to invest their gratuity in a lap paid to demobilise soldiers in a new life in the country. Genes of chicken farming or market gardening may have been easily shattered, but the patch of land and the, owner, the house the owner built on it remained. More still became cyclists, ramblers, walkers, and went out into the countryside in search of a new and better rural England. What's interesting, in, as in 1921, census noted, rural population appeared to have fallen since 1911, quote, but in fact it had grown because of, quote, the gradual extension of the urban at the expense of the rural districts. The extraordinary thing is that rural depopulation finished in Britain in 1911. In 1911, for the first time, the urban, the rural population increased. The countryside, the, uh, the suburb, as Peter Mandler writes, was coming of age. The cities flowed out into the countryside, and the countryside was under siege in a way it had never been, even at the height of the Industrial Revolution. In the spring of 1921, much of this was still to come. However, to those who looked outside the prosperity of their farms and their villages, there were ominous signs of change. Internationally, cereal production picked up and imports of cereals started to seriously affect British prices. On the wages boards, farmers' representatives started to talk about a reduction in wages. In Norfolk, the county where wheat prices mattered more than anywhere else, a series of meetings in 1921 called for a general reduction in wages, while nationally, Mr. George Mutimer, the farmer, the Norfolk representative of the National Farmers Union, said farmers in his county were at their beam ends owing to the slump in corn prices. In country districts, as elsewhere, unemployment was increasing rapidly. And in the same week that Mr. Mutner talked about the farmer being as beam end, 1,800 men and women demonstrated outside Norwich Workhouse. Many of those, according to the account, were wearing service badges. Most in the rural districts, though, probably believed it was a temporary hiccup. After all, there had been many before, and the government offered price guarantees. However, it was not to be. For most of the next 20 years, British farming was to go through a profound depression which affected all those who lived in the rural areas and many who did not. The land fit for heroes, for countrymen and countrywomen at least, was a short-lived 